Hello, and welcome to the Lunar Society podcast, where we discuss ideas and provide a lively forum to influence change through stimulating ideas, broadening debate, and catalyzing action. I am your host, Deirdre Labassier, Honorary Secretary of the Lunar Society and the Governance Compliance Manager and Data Protection Officer of Housing 21. I'm duly introducing myself as we are at Housing 21 in partnership with the Lunar Society holding an incredibly exciting and very pertinent debate on the topic of the changing face of the care workforce, which is to be held on 22nd May 2019 at 5.30 p.m. at the University of Birmingham. I am incredibly honored to be joined in conversation by Joel Blake, OBE, an award-winning entrepreneur and leadership diversity consultant with over 15 years of experience in helping companies integrate diversity and innovation to develop talent and growth. Thank you, Joel, for joining us. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Joel is actually going to be joined on the night by Siobhan N. Dean, Unite National Officer from Unite Union, Angela Cately, Director of Operations, Community Catalyst, Georgina Turner, Director of Sector Development, Engagement, Skills for Care, and Sophia Nakuda, Head of People and Strategy at Housing 21. But you're not here to hear me. We're going to hear a bit more from Joelle. And as an introduction, Joelle, do you want to tell us a bit more about who you are and what you do? Well, once again, thanks for inviting me. Um, so I've spent the last... 15 to 20 years really following my passion which has been around ensuring people can maximize their potential of any difference that they have mm. um, and I've taken that passion into the world of business into community development and into public sector activity um, but the one thing that's always stayed true to me is the fact that when it comes to diversity Diversity is often placed into a very politicised camp, if you like. It's very much looked at as a age thing or a race thing or a gender thing, disability, whatever the protected characteristic is. But for me, diversity has always been around that difference and how you leverage that dif difference to create change. And for me, that's no different for when it comes to talent. Because an individual person is an individual person. Mm -hmm. And the label you may give them, for me, is part of who they are, but it's not who they are. And for me, I've always been passionate about helping people to become the best that they can be based on who they are. Right. So in terms of, of our question as to the change in face of the care workforce then, in maximizing differences that people have, would you say that that is an integral part of, of who the, the change in workforce are or have the workforce always been the same? Has the talent always been there, but we probably haven't harnessed that talent for the benefits of, um, of the beneficiaries of the workforce? I mean, and, and, you know, just as a caveat, this is not about generalising, but if you look at the workforce within the care system historically, yeah. there's been a combination of, you may say, BAME workers, um, so black and minority ethnic workers, um, maybe middle-aged to older workers, young people on the other spectrum who might be doing it in a part-time capacity. Um, and so there's always been a kind of a general profile of people in the care system. But I think if you look at the parallels in other industries and other sectors and look at where we are in the world, the whole population and demographic has shifted. So even if you just look locally where we are in the Midlands, we've got a high youth population, mm -hmm. a high uh, diverse population, and we're in the smack bang in the middle of a global and technolog technological age. We are. So when you look at that combination of youth, diversity and technology, what we actually have is a workforce that's that's evolving into a more forward-thinking, millennial, very much a digital-driven workforce, or at least a workforce that's open to um, more and different ways of doing things, mm -hmm. and using technology in some ways to automate tasks and activity. So that would affect the, the care sector as well as any other sector. 
And so it's got to be, it's important that the care organisations out there are aware of how they're engaging that next generation of workforce in order to meet the needs of the next generation of people who are coming into that care system. You mentioned older people um, as um, workers themselves. So do you think that there's a space um, for the organisations that do have the, um, who, who are needing the, the workforce to upskill those older workers so that they can actually be in work? 100% because there's an actual myth that all the young people out there have all the skills that you need for the jobs that are available. Mm. You have to remember that older workers, particularly those who are returning to work, have heritage, they have wisdom, they have skills, they have experience. What they may not have is an understanding of the modern day-to-day -day skills that would enable them to leverage what they already know and enable them to leverage what they know better. Mm. Um, and so for me, it is about organisations investing in both young and older workers but, it, but more specifically around older workers, it's doing it in a way that allows them to understand in a very simple, would I say layman's, but in a very simple way that allows them to take ownership of their own skills rather than feel they're being taught, helping them to feel like they're learning. Absolutely. And there's a very distinct, there's a distinct line, but a very important line between the two. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, yeah, it's about making sure that we can attract both young and older workers to the sector and retain them as well. Retention is key. Um, I mean, how many times do we hear stories of people coming into a workplace, into a workforce, doing, you know, a year, two years, mm. two and a half years, maybe three, and looking for something else? You know, the average young person, I'm not 100% sure on the stats, but the average young person would have anywhere between five to seven different jobs before they reach the age of 35. It's a lot of jobs. It's a lot of jobs, <laughs> but it's also a lot of experience. Yes. If you put that on your CV, it doesn't look ideal. You know, if you go for a job and you leave it every every year, you know, two years. But what it does offer is a range of experience and skills that that person can take into another role, yes, and another role and another role. And it's whether the whether your organisation is one that taps into that forward thinking individual who has those wide range of skills and might just need some support to harness them, yes. harness it, and then direct them in the right direction. Now, from an older worker point of view, who might come from a history of job for life almost and have really 20, 30 years of experience in an industry, it's how do you help them to learn from but also teach that kind of gig economy worker mm. who's always working, looking for that next thing. So I think there's something around mentoring, um, something around peer-to-peer -peer mentoring in particular, but certainly mentoring programs, training programs, leadership programs that are focused on generating loyalty uh, with, with all the workforce that would help the retention because mm. people want to feel valued for who they are and what they could bring to an organization and that's regardless of age regardless of difference and so the more there is as i say more investment in those types of programs is the more you'll see an increase in retention yeah. it sounds to me like there could be some sort of cross fertilization mentorship absolutely yeah absolutely and, and it's funny i was in a uh, work with a, a client the other day and by helping them to implement a reverse mentoring program where they had um, the younger people in their organization working with the senior execs to help the senior execs understand what it's really like now mm. and give us some thoughts in terms of the strategy that they should be employing in the future. There's no reason why such a model couldn't work within, within teams, mm -hmm. whether it's middle management, whether it's about, you know, ground level stuff, whatever the level, there's, there's, there's experience and knowledge and understanding and wisdom that can be shared. It's whether or not an organisation wants to take the risk and to be willing to kind of lead the way, if you like, with these innovative ways of engaging, these innovative ways of learning. Because what we don't want at the same time is a lack of inclusion because those who have the power at the top do not see the point in doing things differently. Well, I suppose for every risk there's an opportunity to be had. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk a bit about um, those people who might want to um, care for their parents. So those baby boomers who you know, need to care for their parents, and particularly for parents who are living much longer, who may end up having chronic diseases such as diabetes or HIV, um, and they have increased life expectancy, but not necessarily good health. In that, so how would we how would we just 
balance that type of dynamic, do you think? I think, again, it's the introduction of innovative ways of engaging people. So, for example, with the health agenda, how many organisations are out there providing yoga classes? Mm. First, first thing in the morning kind of exercise sessions. Healthy eating initiatives. I mean, a lot of organisations have seen they're doing a lot of kind of walking initiatives, you know, take the stairs, not the lift, those types of things. But I think the integration of health awareness is key and the education and the ability to enact on that education is, is very important. So I think there needs to be a level of holistic support that develops the individual within an organisation. Mm, Not so much you come to work and that's it. More, let's create an environment where you have some ownership because you're feeling valued and you're seeing the benefit of being able to be given the freedom to enact on that value that's being created. Um, and there's a balance with that. You know, commercially, you've got to think about the budgetary, uh, budgetary um, commitments to those types of initiatives, um, the alignment with strategy and being willing to see it through, not necessarily seeing the results in the short term, but willing to see it through because it adds to the culture of the organisation. So there's a lot of foresight and a lot of confidence building that needs to take place within an organisation to make the investment required. But we also have to bear in mind that organisations are also living in a we're operating, I should say, in a more of a global world, so in a global, local world. <laughs> your competition is no longer the organisation on the same street and in the same region. Yes. Your competition is anyone in the world because of the way technology has, has made it easier to democratise competition. Mm. So it's whether or not you see the investment at that level as being relevant for the organisation, knowing that you may not see the impacts immediately but you're creating a workforce that is going to help you to become sustainable because you're now creating a culture that is valuing the person, not the processes and the system. So Will, what you're saying really is that the value of individuals, value of the workforce, value of the, the people who are in care of themselves mm. is key to, to, to benefits. Absolutely. Because yeah. if, if, if you're asking people who have a personality for caring then, yes. to care for your clients, to care for your colleagues, mm. to care for your suppliers, your stakeholders across the piece. Mm. Who's caring for them? Exactly. Exactly. Who is caring for them? And, and employers, I think, have a, a, a definite part to play yeah. in caring for their workforce. Absolutely. In yeah. this day and age, more than ever before, it, it's funny because I was having a conversation with, with, with colleagues the other day and we were talking about, is the, is the world going back towards the days of your Cadbury's and Quakers mm -hmm. and creating societies within a business mm -hmm. in, its, in, its greatest, in the greatest sense of the word? Mm -hmm. You know, are we going back to a community-driven approach to business, mm -hmm. which for a while has been kind of almost pigeonholed as charitable, social enterprise, mm. third sector, not-for-profit. Mm. But are we going back to a commercial world that is actually built on ethics and values and therefore those things of, or that notion of social impact becomes more of a natural, mm. a natural thing? Mm. And I think we are, because I think in, to a degree it's been dictated by this new generation coming through. Mm. You know, we're living in a very much a generation of particularly younger people who are questioning the value and ethics of organisations that they're working for. Mm. You know, no longer just about what your pay level is or what your training package is, but what are you doing to actually help me? And do your values as an organisation resonate with my values as an individual? Mm. So I think just by the very nature of the generations that are coming through, we're coming back to this kind of organic sense of community mm. and social impact and social drive. And I think the winners are the organisations who will look at that and put that at the heart of their business whilst being transparent about the value of doing that mm -hmm. from a commercial aspect. Well, it's, it's, it's care for care, isn't care for it? Care. And um, I mean, it's a great phrase, actually. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you own that. Yes, I own that. IP. I will IP that. <laughs> so, I mean, actually, uh, an incredible case in point is the organization that I work for, House in 21. Mm -hmm. And we, um, we are 
we, we walk the talk of our values. And one of the values for the, the main value for this year um, for, that permeates through in the entire organization is do the right thing. And that is our benchmark for everything that we do within the organization. And I personally find it in terms of my role, which is in corporate, but which affects um, my colleagues and the residents. I ensure that in everything that I do, I'm doing the right thing. And I, mm -hmm. I, I work in compliance, but I do it with from a very ethics-driven mm -hmm. perspective. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's not just about the bottom line, but it's about how the bottom line can actually serve the value purpose Absolutely. of the organization and for the benefit of the people In fact, we're serving. I think there's another the phrase you just said there, it's that value purpose. Yes. I think you know we all know about the triple bottom line piece. Okay. Um, in terms of the impacts that can be created, but there's a sense of value that needs to be identified. Again, when I talk to other people about um, business, one of the things that we've always heard is this thing around unique selling point. Yes. To me, I think that notion is quite redundant. I think it's more about your unique value proposition. Because if, if people buy into the value that you provide, Absolutely. the selling is how you sell that value. So you can be unique in how you sell something, so there's a level of validity there. But ultimately, what people are buying is how valuable is your product or service to me mm. based on the perception that I have of your product or service. Mm. Because the perceptions that, that will sell, mm. it's the brand awareness, it's the understanding of if I spend money on X, this is going to give me Y. And it's the perception that that transaction is going to take place. So if you're... If you're an organization that doesn't understand what your value proposition is, and there I say your value purpose, then people won't buy into your story. Absolutely. Or dare I say just the whole narrative of what you're trying to sell. Absolutely. And then again, in this competitive market and this real technology-driven or digitally-driven market that we're in, your story is more important than ever before. Mm -hmm. And that's what the next generation are buying into. That's what they're going to be challenging you on. And that's what needs to be something that's absolutely transparent. And as you say, it goes through the heart of the organization. Mm -hmm. So for Housing 21 to be taking that approach from the start, you're ahead of the curve, 100%. You know, and it's, it's those organizations who no longer f see that as important are the ones who are going to make themselves obsolete. Absolutely. You have to have an authentic narrative. Mm -hmm. It has to be true. Mm -hmm. Well... Joel, I don't want to give everything away <laughs> for the night, <laughs> and I'm really hoping that everyone who listens to this podcast, that they can hear the passion that you're coming at this with, and I know for certain that the other panelists are going to be just as passionate. I'm expecting some quite diverse um diverse views so be prepared to chair it's going to be amazing because yeah, i think to it. it is it's going to be fantastic we're, we're going to have um some incredible perspectives on differences in terms of what's needed for the care sector what views they have on the care sector and um and yeah and, and what I'm really hoping that we'll come out of this. It's not just going to be a talking shop. Um, I'm really hoping that we will be able to have the people who will be affected um, hear and understand and give their views and we can influence policy and we can actually attract people into the care sector and retain them with value and that they benefit from the freedoms that they can have um, from that value. So Joel, I just want to say thank you so much thank for you. meeting with me tonight. And um, Joel and I will see you on the 22nd of May at 5.30 p.m. at the University of Birmingham in Edgbaston. And we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you.